we'll start with today's episode of uh, marvelous medicine the topic is hand surgery mm-hmm. and the speaker is the dr jimmy matthew he is a clinical professor and a reconstructive microsurgeon of plastic surgery at amrita institute of medical sciences kochi he did his mbbs from government medical college chitur is ms general surgery from jipma pondicherry and mcs plastic surgery from government medical college kozhikod he has been working in amrita institute from 2009 and was part of the surgical team that did india's and south asia's first hand transplant he has more than 20 publications in national and international journals he is a writer and editor at info clinic an avid multilingual writer and blogger he has published five books for gen uh, so welcome me and we hope to see uh, your journey in hand surgery over the past two decades thank you thank you very much our session will be dr karun agarwal and dr veer pushotaman uh, dr karun agarwal is a consultant at the national heart institute delhi is mbbs and ms surgery from raipur and mcs plastic surgery from pj chandigarh he was previously the director professor and head of department of plastic surgery at sardarjan hospital and jipma pondicherry he is the founder editor in chief of journal of cleft lip palate and craniofacial anomalies he has more than 150 journal publications many textbook chapters he is the chief editor of a recently released six volume textbook on plastic reconstructive and aesthetic surgery he is the past president of association of plastic surgeons of india national academy of burns india and indian society of cleft lip palate and craniofacial anomalies dr karun agarwal uh, joined the department of uh, 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 plastic surgery at jipma when i was doing my senior residency and uh, and uh, i saw the first um, uh, continuous axillary block done by him i i, I saw my first groin flap uh, with him and uh, and the only uh, gender reallocation surgery i have seen in my life is uh, one dr karun agarwal did so uh, thank you very much for joining dr karun despite your busy schedule dr purushottaman is a senior consultant plastic hand burns facial maxillary and microvascular surgery at apollo first med and fortis muller hospitals chennai he did his mbbs from tanjore medical college and uh, ms general surgery and mcs plastic surgery from madras medical college the faculty for the dnb plastic surgery course at apollo first med he has several national and international publications and has conducted many mi- workshops in microsurgery he is the past president of brachial plexus surgery group of india and also the past president of tamil nadu and pondicherry association of plastic surgeons dr purushottaman is a avid golfer and a man of few words my association with dr purushottaman is for over 25 years and he is the one who taught me how to do a axillary block Uh, welcome dr purushottaman and thanks for joining though you are on a holiday in uk over to you jimmy thank you i am really thrilled to uh, attend this and thank you for uh, wonderful can you see the screen yes okay see first of all i would like to say that dr purushottaman and dr kairun would have been much better than me actually to <laughs> give this address uh this hand surgery because i am not a specialist hand surgeon uh, my uh, area of interest is head and neck reconstruction and breast reconstruction and peripheral um, sarcoma peripheral tumor surgeries uh, but i have been doing hand surgery of throughout and uh, um i can do it and uh, i am i i was called probably because of my other involvement in other forums and uh, this particular um, lgs in particular so let us start anyway um i'm having some problem with the slides yeah all right so this is sterling bernal the one of the first hand surgeons and hand surgery started in after world war 2 when they realized that um, hand hand injuries have got one of the worst results so they brought in um, a general surgeon who was interested in hand surgery to start hand surgery units all over us and we usually follow the west that is how it came and then there was j william little in usa and he was a plastic surgeon who was in charge of the war and hand injuries and that is how uh, these hand surgeries fell into the plastic surgeons ambit 
and there was another other reasons too because it needed some specialized skills like microsurgery uh, soft tissue handling etc and both orthopedicians and plastic surgeons were found to be good uh, and combination and further training was imparted to these specialists to be trained as plastic surgeons i mean hand surgeons right now all over the world hand surgeons hand surgery general hand surgery is handled by most of the plastic surgery uh, plastic surgeons of the world and orthopedicians and general surgeons are offered one or two year i mean fellowships in hand surgery after which they are uh, given full uh, accreditation to do hand surgery that what i found that there are general uh, there are mch type of full residency programs in plastic surgery in some countries notably finland switzerland and sweden so i want to discuss all these issues rather than specifics of hand surgery we know that uh, alexis carrel got a nobel prize for vascular anastomosis in 1912 he transferred the kidney of a dog to his uh, to its neck and found that it was still working then by 1960 you have julius jacobson with with the operating microscope and microanastomosis starting in animals first revascularization revascularization 1963 and you know free jejunum was the first uh, uh, tissue to be transferred i had always always wondered why and it turns out that nakama nakayama was a cardiac surgeon cardiothoracic surgeon and he used uh, free jejunum to for esophageal reconstruction first then it was 1966 um animal uh, trans re i mean replants then first it taught to thumb in 1968 and by uh, 1970s ian taylor um, and all started all the modern microsurgery this is jipma where i study my ms and uh, i was telling about the excellent uh, plastic surgery department headed by dr karun over there which i trained for one month but you see after jipma after a excellent program dr anandakrishnan had a graded uh, training so after an excellent program i was very confident as a general surgeon i thought i knew most uh, almost everything about general surgery and i could do a lot of things and then i joined uh, back in my alma mater in, as a general surgery tutor and i found that i could do dupers then once i did uh, even a, a splenectomy in the emergency without any the associate professor coming and everybody was very much impressed with my training and all that but you see it is like uh, this is culinary piety and uh, there is a story in our state like uh, one person came to learn culinary piety to, to a guru and after six months of training he the guru asked him now what can you do then he said i can you know beat 50 big men in combat and then he said uh, no no you have to train more so after six months he again said oh, no no now i can take 20 big men and i can beat them then he said no no you can you have to train more then finally at the end of 7 or 8 years of training he said now i think i can take on one big man and he said okay now your training is complete so <laughs> i i believe that it, it has been like that for me to uh, the more experienced i have become the more uh, you know careful and circumspect i have become uh, the case in point was that when i did my uh, lectureship over there one of my own relatives came with a, what is known as a paronychia and i ended up thinking it was a felon it was not really clear where the pus was pointing and putting an incision on the pulp for that time internet was not there and i could not find out um, from the internet so i had to go around asking people where, where exactly to put it and reading it up so the pus is actually in the nail fold okay and you have to put an incision over here if you want to drain it incision over here or go under the nail but and if need required uh, remove a little bit of the nail nail not this much so you see our training can be very patchy and uh, uh, even a commonest hand infection can be mismanaged uh, this is something i learned uh, you see as general surgeons and as general orthopedic surgeons as rural surgeons when you go out i know many um, young just surgeons would be watching this so you have to be humble and read nowadays you can it's easy you know you can learn it from the youtube see it but you have to learn your limits 
Um, the first thing you have to learn is uh, hand incisions. And these are some of the incisions. I'm not going to the details of all this because this is there everywhere all over the field. And um, uh, these, these are the, some of the things that you should probably know and how to drain for abscess, incisions for drainage of abscesses and where they are located and how to uh, do. See, this is another thing. In Jipmer, all the hand infections used to come to the gen surgery. And we have done, I have done, my senior residents have done, I have seen them. But then now I realize that I never knew the digital nerves. I never saw a digital nerve in my entire life. I'm not, no, I saw it in um, plastic surgery department. But before that, I never saw a single digital nerve while I was doing I was aware that tendons were there and muscles were there. That's all. So it is like a blind man doing something. Whenever uh, I was doing, uh, abscess drainage and management of uh, hand infections over there as a general surgeon, in spite of the good training there. So that's what. This is how a fasciotomy is done. This was also something which I did not pro properly do or properly understand, even though I had done so many fasciotomies for electrical burns and burn management, which usually general surgeons do in our country as a routine in a lot of centers. So this is something you should know. I'm not saying in the details, uh, you have to avoid, this is to avoid the nerves. Uh, the right way to splint a hand. This is something you should know. Uh, there is 30 degree, it's at 40, uh, it's 90 degree, metacarpal phalangeal joints at 90 degree, PIP at zero degree, and how to elevate a limb. So the bare minimum I would say a general surgeon should know is the examination, how to look at the vascularity, whether it's pink or not, fingers are pink or not, and the SPO2 probe, which has come, is a very good adjunct. And I'll take questions on this, how to assess if uh, later, because we will have time then. Compartment syndrome is another thing. Transferring a part, how to transfer an amputated part is another thing. Splinting, ma bandaging, managing bleeding. Maybe I'll talk to it after the end, I mean, towards the end. How to transfer a part and manage bleeding while referring. You know, a lot of time you see uh, people putting arteries blindly into the wounds and catching the nerves and they're coming with a bandaged, I mean, ligated nerve, which is such a depressing thing to see, <laughs> you know, once you open a wound and see a uh, ligated nerve, it is like, oh my goodness, what have they done? Like that kind of thing. So, and hand infections. And uh, then I went to uh, Kohlkot Medical College, which is a state-run college and a nice place. But there also the hand trauma was regularly handled by the orthopedicians. What they used to do was in the end of each day, there used to be a list of um, cases, hand cases, or all the hand cases will be kept pending. And at 10 o'clock in the night, this list will be given to the first year orthopedic resident to finish. This was how hand injuries were done. So we took in special interest and uh, uh, as I told as I told earlier put in a, another theater we made a local theater and started doing first time hand surgery by plastic surgeons in Calicut Medical College something which I am proud of, proud of. and uh, Dr. Sarama our professors were very interested in that and we did our first brachial artery repair by the plastic surgery department there. I have stories to tell about all this but I won't go into that kind of thing and uh, first so uh, soft tissue transfer, free soft tissue transfer in Calicut Medical College was also done when I was five years there. Uh, then I went to uh, two years I trained in, I mean, I was a junior surgeon in Baby Memorial Hospital and almost two years in St. John's Medical College, Bangalore. So there, these two places, I had a lot of exposure to trauma. And uh, in one place, Baby Memorial, my boss was a trained hand surgeon from Kleinert Institute, USA. So you can say my basic techniques were all from him. Okay, so there is a, there is a lot of variation in the treatment of hand. That is a problem which I'll talk about later. And now we'll just go through hand surgery in, a lot, in some cases. Okay, uh, so that, um, I mean, it'll be more interesting. This, this lady came, he's an associate professor of medicine in a medical college, came with severe pain in the little finger. All right. She was having it for two, three years and she had gone to see the ladies, a doctor, a professor of medicine. And she had, uh, she, her husband was also a doctor. They went to an orthopedic surgeon 
It doesn't matter which what surgeon. He was a senior surgeon. He diagnosed it properly, probably. I don't know. He opened and said that it must be, it's a so small tumor, but nothing could be felt. Only pain was there. He opened and he removed it. All right. He removed something with no relief of pain. Then he, they went to another general surgeon who also opened and removed it. Said they removed it. And uh, there was no uh, this thing of pain. I mean, relief of pain. Then uh, somebody, another orthopedician removed it again. And he said he will cut the digital nerve and he has made some incisions all over the finger here. But when the patient came, she had her um, sensations intact. The pain was still there, excruciating pain on that uh, dot. There. And my immediate thing was to do an MRI. You now you just see this is a glomus tumor is very much there. As you can see, it is very much there. Nothing has happened yet. So after locating with, it, with the, this thing, I went ahead with surgery. The lady, the doctor was uh, adamant that you amputate it. This has to finish by this. Okay, even if you have to amputate it, I have to get rid of it. So I was careful when I opened it, it was all fibrosed. So I did not take any uh, risk, even though I knew this was the tumor. This was probably the tumor because of the fibrosis. I removed that entire fibrosis skin and put in a homodigital flap. She refused a, a cross finger flap. And you can see the homodigital flap has crossed the joint here. So this, you can maybe say that I have violated a principle, but you see, and I put in um, hypothenar graft from here to cover that uh, tr simple transposition flap. But, uh, and, but the proof of the pudding is probably in the and the um, glomus tumor. And you can see, uh, I do my physiotherapy by myself. You cannot trust it to anybody else. And I used to watch the physiotherapist do it. And I used to go to the OPD whenever I was junior, some three, four years to or whatever institution I was initially there. I used to go to the OPD and see all the post-ops and how the post-op physiotherapy was done. This is one of the few things I am proud of in my life is this. That And I call all my hand patients every week and do the physiotherapy myself because it is very difficult otherwise. You see the function and that is how it should be. And uh, this is just uh, another injury. You know, just to demonstrate that even a small this thing, you will feel like just suturing it off. Never do it. Open it, see. You can see that the cut has gone correctly into the carpal, I mean, through the fascia and as you injured a digital nerve, digital nerves has to be repaired by micro repair because it gives excellent results because it is not a mixed nerve, it's a sensory nerve. Now, this is how you approach a tumor. This is a small uh, tumor here. Actually, it is a vascular malformation. Uh, this is just to tell you how to approach a tumor. You open the hand and go under the palmar fascia and you will see the vessels immediately. So you can see the artery can see the nerve. Then you follow them from a normal area to the abnormal area. This is how you will find out even from, from severed nerves, severed, uh, uh, I mean, in the wounds also, this is how you go about it, from normal to uh, proximal, I mean, to the injured place. Uh, this is just uh, uh, just another, um, there is a, I don't know, there's a story associated, uh, which, which I am, I won't tell you now, maybe later. Uh, this was, I was doing another, this patient was injured both in the leg and in the hand. And um, this, uh, I was operating in the leg under the resident. I was asked, I, I asked the resident to suture the hand, in, hand wound because I knew that uh, I had examined the wound and found that it had not breached the deep fascia. Once the, the hand is not, the wound is not, uh, has not breached the deep fascia. No? There's no point in uh, exploring it much. That's you were hundred percent sure that it has not deep breached the deep fascia or the palmar fascia. Maybe you can suture it, but if it's a small puncture wound, and you are not able to ascertain. Then you have to uh, explore it. That is the dictum here. So I just asked him to suture. Then he said, "Sir, the, there is a uh, artery cut artery here which you have to repair. The radial artery is cut." I was surprised. I went and again saw it and I asked him, okay, if you want, you repair it. But I realized that it is not actually the radial artery. It is a superficial branch of the radial artery and uh, quite superficial. But he has done it very well. 
Nice. So it's one way in which people can get trained. At this, you know, every Diwali, Christmas, every Vishu, when I was working in Calicut and even in St. Arts, we used to get these blast injuries. And uh, in the um, baby memorial that I remember, we had once, I counted 14 blast injuries in one night, 14. Um, and uh, this is how they come to you. And uh, this is how it looks. You know, opening a hand is just like opening the abdomen, only much more difficult. <laughs> You, you should know the technique. Otherwise, you cannot do it properly. This is just, uh, we you debride. This is just to show the anatomy. You see, after, after the initial debrima, we may have to do, do repeated debrimas. They usually end up with, a, you know, the carpal metacarpal joint is uh, shattered here. You may have to put caver here. And there are some fractures here. You have to fix it. And then uh, after serial debridements, you most probably will have to put a uh, flap here. Usually a groin flap is what we put. This is a tendon repair. This is a dorsal tendon repair, dorsal tendon repair. But this is one of those tendon repairs which require, uh, you know, the extensive tendons are easy to suture. Even if an orthopedician does it properly, uh, not trained, or a general surgeon who is not very well trained, suturing it, it, you will get a good result. But what I'm saying is that you should not take everything so lightly. You see here, somebody has uh, screwed up uh, flexor tendon repair, and then it has got retracted, it has failed, it has got retracted. And uh, now they, he has come for um, uh, secondary tendon reconstruction. This is an extremely difficult thing. You, you, they say, I mean, everywhere it will be described that you can do Palmaris longest tendon graft and all that. It will, in my hands, it is very bad result. This case, I gave it to Dr. Dr. Kishore. Ah, yeah, Dr. Kishore was, I, I remember Dr. Kadun's uh, senior resident. He was, uh, he worked in 13 years in specialist hospital. And, and uh, I, this, that's a good thing being a team, you know. So I uh, gave it to him and he's putting in a silicon rod, you know, silicon rod. And uh, later uh, we'll remove the silicon rod and put in a tetra graft. This is the bread and butter of, uh, if you are in a trauma center and a hand center, you a lot of this door crush will come. You know, this they come thinking that you will do microsurgery and uh, keep it back. But what you re really require to do is to see whether it is pink. Uh, okay. If it's not pink, there are other ways uh, we may have to go about it. If it is still pink, all you have to do is uh, you, you suture the nail, but with the 6 o or 5 o um, vicryl undyed vicryl or uh, rapid vicryl and then keep the nail bed, nail back. Remove the nail and it's a simple case of nail bed repair. You can use small caves, 0.5 mm to if the bone fragment is big. Never underestimate skin grafts. You can put skin grafts in post-trauma. Only, absolutely only skin is gone. So this is how you do it. Um, post-burn contracture release, post-burn, so, this is just to show the variety of hand surgeries you may have, you may come across. It's not the same case. This is another case in which a small contra contraction band has, sorry, small contraction band has been released and a Z-plasty has done. But uh, don't think that usually it is possible. Usually you see whenever you release, so never be, uh, you know, think that you can just release it and then just put a, um, small skin graft and get it. Look at the amount of graft that is required uh, to for the, when you release this much, this much of contracture. And I usually put quilting sutures, skin grafts in these kind of places. Uh, even it's not very simple. It is difficult for you to place and get the whole thing done properly. This is another type of cases which I'm usually proud of because you see, this is the, the I'm sorry for the video quality, which I took it in my, the, I mean, mobile camera. See, he has come after one, one to one and a half months of post -ex excision and grafting of burns, just to show the variety of hand surgery. So, uh, see, it is very thick and very edematous, full thickness burn of the hand. So I have immediately gone in and did the excision and grafting, the second day of birth. So this is a type of 
uh, function functional um, this thing you can you can get you can get this kind of function see i uh, i had to exercise almost till the tip of the fingers still he has got this kind of result which you will never get if you allow it to granulate and skin graft uh, this is another routine case we he came just uh, one month back i mean two three months back i saw him just uh, two or three days back and uh, he had multiple fractures and the loss of uh, skin with exposure of exposure of a tendon here so this is a cross finger flap has been done and he had multiple metacarpal head fractures which i cavoid now these are these are the cases where i mean these are the areas where there are a lot of differences in what people do uh, this this i have done see that you can see there are multiple unsta actually unstable intraarticular fractures this uh, x rays are not very uh, clear because i take at photos from the computer screen uh, there are multiple comminuter fragments which are not really stable but i have just put in uh, instead of uh, anatomical reduction i just reduced it opened it and reduced it. see this is one um, this thing orthopedicians might do repeated uh, with cm repeated closed reduction manipulation care i have learned it like this being done in when i have i was trained you open it and see it and do it you, you make an anatomical reduction and just keep it just keep it with splints and you can see this one has uh, the, the the this one has gone in quite a bit into the this thing the most important thing about hand injury is that you have to take out these caves immediate i mean as soon as possible maybe at four weeks uh, or at the most six weeks and start immobilization mobilization if you, if not whatever you do will be in waste you can see this uh this is the latest x-ray and you you can see it has come quite well and i'm sorry for the this thing in that place where we have done the cross finger no, there was a um crush fracture with a longitudinal component and a comminuted um intraarticular fracture here i'm sorry but this i did not fix this i did not fix i just left it like that because it was not uh um these are the places this this is just to tell you um just to show you that there can be so many variations each hand injury is different and unless you have adequate experience you will be totally confused as to what to do that is that is what what i want to tell you uh th this is just a tip injury in which a cross finger flap has been done this is another tip injury in which cross finger flap has been done this is an abdominal step ladder flap multiple um, but this could have been managed in a better way maybe this is a thumb reconstruction with an oblique triangular flap now thumb partial thumb amputation with a this again is not my case this is not my case this is also something which i'll criticize i'll probably just do a cross finger in this because too costly i feel this kind of flaps are too costly this is a melanoma thumb in which an fdma something known as a little bit of a very um, elegant flap has been done this is called a first dorsal metacarpal artery flap uh, this is a die that blue thing is a die don't get scared for because we had done a sentinel node biopsy and the blue die had been injected and you can see we have taken the just like a cross finger flap that skin over there based on the first dorsal do metacarpal artery highlighted and we have put it here we would have skin, skin graft over there this is a case of a post trauma sometimes you you get uh, runovers or severe trauma like this this is where again issues of um, training comes in because if you are in the us and uh, this comes to a hand surgeon he would do the whole thing because there it's either the plastic surgeons after one or two years of a fellowship are trained in fixing all the bones of the hand from humerus down and the nerves after is everything but here um, uh, i at the wrist level i have to stop because i am not trained in that. at the wrist i have to stop i have to uh, you know call in our orthopedic colleagues and here they have come and put an external fixator and finally there were nerves vessels 
uh, everything, multiple debridements, nerve grafting, everything. We are put in an anterolateral thigh free flap and uh, reconstructed. Uh, this is an interesting case. Uh, as I told you, uh, peripheral sarcomas and peripheral uh, tumors has been one of my interests. Here, there it comes directly to us, most of it. And we do the resection. Again, I'm, I want to discuss this um, issues of training. Who should be trained to do cancers of these areas? Um, how should you have fellowships designed for these kind of things? Which all specialties should be allowed? These are all not at all clear in our, um, unfortunately, in our system, in our country. And that is a problem. Uh, not in my hospital, because we are all type of people doing different type of things, but uh, in, in the periphery, it can be a problem. Here, uh, it's a osteosarcoma. It's a very difficult case to do. It's a really tough one. You see, it, uh, it, is, an, it is involving all the muscles, all the muscles on the uh, origin of the humerus, around the shoulder joint, all the muscles. And all the muscles had to be um, uh, resected along with the tumor. Here I have done it along with my friend, orthopedic surgeon, uh, but he just stood by. He said he will only cut the bone and the joint. So I had to do most of the work. This is a fibula flap. We have taken the fibula along with the peroneal artery. And uh, you see, what I did was again, uh, because it's a forum for surgeons in general, you would be interested to know how we, I went about it. Uh, we made an incision from here to here, a bold, large incision. And I went from, uh, and I just went there and followed all the nerves and arteries, major nerves and arteries. There's uh, all the brachial plexus nerves as well as the brachial artery uh, throughout uh, its course. And I dissected it and kept it apart to this side. And then followed the radial nerve from there and it is, it is going under the humerus here. No? So then I expose the radial nerve here and then I expose the radial nerve here till it disappears under the humerus. Then we cut the humerus off. Then we dissected it off the radial nerve like this, like that there. And then uh, took out all the muscles and uh, with everything else intact and put in the, uh, uh, the fibula into the uh, acromion, into the joint cavity, into the joint. It is an arthrodesis. And then I have anastomosed it to the entocyte to the brachial artery and uh, to the vena committance of the brachial artery. He did well. He, he had come back after some time. This is just a superficial circumflex iliac flap for the first web space. This is again a critique. See, what have we achieved by this flap? really speaking, I mean, I would criticize this because we wanted to do a, a superficial circumflex iliac artery flap, the same as the groin flap, but we had to, we took it free, thinking that it will be uh, thin, but it is not thin. And I genuinely feel that a skin graft would have been much better. So it is not like, because you can do something, doing it may not be the right thing to do. Now, of course, uh, replants are the one important thing which everyone wants to do. And I mean, it's a, just got the charm of its own. And initially, Dr. Pata and Dr. Vidya had asked me to uh, talk on replantation. But I said, see, I'm not that person who does replant alone for a long time. But hand transplant, hand uh, surgery in general would be more interesting to us, not non-specialist audience like this. So that is how finally it became a general hand surgery talk. So whenever you uh, get a thumb replants like this, how to transfer the part? You should know that you should put the thumb or amputated part and clean it if, if you can. If you can clean it, you clean it, put it in a plastic bag and tie it up. And then, or you can just put it, cover it in a gauze piece, um, ring, uh, wrung out gauze piece or even a dry gauze piece and put it in a plastic bag and put it in ice. But never in direct contact with ice. This is how you should transport. And whenever you have a bleeding wound in the hand or in the uh, leg and it is spurting, don't panic. If you want to refer this patient, put in gauze pieces, put gloves and put continuous pressure and look at the clock for 15 minutes. 
it will stop with that. If it doesn't stop with that, and if it is soaking through the wound, keep pressing for 15 minutes, and then put one or two more gauze and keep it for some more time. Tie a nice bandage, snug bandage there. Wait for 45 minutes to see that the bleeding has stopped. And then over pad it and send it. This is how you should do it. Ne never try to put in arteries at that point of time and blindly try to catch bleeders. That is counterproductive. Oh, this is how we, we do a replant. First, the bones are done, then one or two arteries, and then the uh, one side, you finish the digital nerve. Then you do, you turn it uh, this way, finish the tendon on one side, turn it and do the tendon as well, and then the vein. So this is how we would do. These are micro instruments. These are the instruments you would uh, need for microsurgery. Uh, most of the hand surgeries, digital nerves, everything you would require them and uh, micro clamps, jeweler's forceps. This is the jeweler forceps. Then the micro scissors, micro um, you know, needle holders. This needle, these are very similar to ophthalmic instruments. If you see ophthalmic instruments, because my father is an ophthalmologist. So when we started microsurgery, he gave me a set of, his own set of ophthalmic instruments and I used them to do the first uh, arterial surgery and all that. There is slight difference. They use much shorter instruments and they won't fit in till your web space. But it is, uh, these are, uh, this is an artery ready for anastomosis, club kept in the clamps. And you, basically it is interrupted stitches are what we are using for the smaller vessels, smaller vessels. And we as uh, microsurgeons usually prefer interrupted switches as opposed to vascular surgeons. Uh, but we used to do uh, in baby and uh, baby memorial, we used to do popliteal artery, brachial artery, femoral artery, everything ourselves. But there we used to do interrupted with 8 0, and it used to work very well. And vascular surgeons usually do 7 0 proline continuous for these injuries. They also work very well in large vessels. But small vessels interrupted might be better for reasons which I won't mention now. So this is a replant. Then this is just a toe transfer for, you know. There are some of the interesting things you can do. This is a Wilkie procedure. You know, for an amputated forearm, this was not done by me. This is a quite little bit of an adventurous surgery. This was done by Dr. Mohit, one of my colleagues. And uh, he has pulled it off quite well, I would say. He was very happy with this. He did not want uh, prosthesis. And of course, I'll end with hand transplant because a lot of transplant surgeons are also there. Uh, we did, uh, we are one of the few centers who have done. I am just one of the five surgeons. That's all. Dr. Subramanya Ayur is the chief and Dr. Mohit Sharma has been in charge of the technical details of it. Uh, but we have done. We have done some eight hand transplants. You know, I would say it is still a procedure which has to be questioned. We have to constantly monitor and see the result. And I would think that next 10 to 15 years will tell you, tell us whether hand transplants and this type of composite transplants will stay or not. Because there is a significant amount of immunosuppression required. And uh, uh, as um, you know, prosthetic hands become better and better. There, now there's a war going on between hand transplant. I would definitely say that single hand arm or single hand transplants are not okay. Even though it is done all over the world in the US, we are doing only double hand transplants. But still we have to see how it pans out. But right now it is acceptable to do it. It is a good way of rehabilitating these people that people accept. That's all I can say about this. Is a hand transplant which is done. As you as you might know, Joseph Murray, another uh, plastic surgeon, uh, who got Nobel Prize in the field of transplantation in 1990. Joseph Murray was a plastic surgeon who did the first transplant, kidney transplant. He um, became very interested in vascular surgery. Then he found out that um, then he did a lot of animal exper experiments. He did kidney transplants in pigs. And he found that it was getting rejected and then between animals. Then he took out um, a kidney, both kidneys from a pig and put it back. Then he found that uh, the urine was flowing. That is how he found that, okay, it was possible actually for an organ to work. 
if both uh, you take it out and put it back and then he suddenly you know fortune favors the brave kind of thing he one day found out a person with a kidney failure who had an identical twin and the identical twin he put uh, the kid they took the kidney of the identical twin and put it in the uh, this this the patient and he was right it, it, it would not get rejected no because they have got the same genes but then it took them 20 more years for the immunosuppressants to develop so that it became actually feasible and he recently received i mean in 1990 he received the nobel prize okay now i think what i have left out i have left out a lot i have left out a lot congenital hands rheumatoid hands deformities tendon transfers and nerve transfers of course the, uh, among this see after this much of uh, years of experience i would say that i have i would do tendon and nerve transfers some of them i don't do brachial plexus uh, only my colleagues do i don't do rheumatoid hand congenital hand maybe uh, syndactyly release i'll do that's all so a lot is left out lot uh, i'm not expert at do and um, now you see hand surgery as a is a discipline on its own now what i would like to see discussed is issues of training how you would train how many years of training you require for example how many more years of training should a general surgeon have how many years of training should an orthopedic surgeon have how to accredit these and setting up of minimum standards and guidelines is something which we do not do in this country you cannot keep on operating uh, according to us standards on all the people of our country and the, which is with, with that is the reality we have to have our own minimum standards and we have to include people from taluk hospital surgeons from surgeons from uh, that uh, level you know district hospital level then give them and according to uh, consult with them and look at the minimum standards and say each specialty has to come up with a guideline so okay for these kind of things these are the things which are the minimum if you can provide you can say that okay this is the even for legal issues i think it's very important because now the you some one patient goes to the court and the court is looking at the textbooks and guidelines which are made in us and uk and applying the same standards over here uh, that they, they, these are the type of things which i would like to see discussed and uh, i think i would uh, end with this this is our first hand transplant patient manu who is working as a transplant counselor and physiotherapist in our department not physiotherapist physiotherapy assistant in our department and this was done in 2015 january and he is still doing well and is one of our really good uh, results i would say but uh, our experience has not been uniformly pleasant that uh, that's something i would say thank you thank you very much and uh, thank you thank you jimmy for that uh, wonderful talk and uh, if you don't mind you can stop uh, sharing your screen yeah uh, over to you dr karun and dr kushal karun yeah karun you go first karun oh okay uh, jimmy thank you so much for uh, this 40 45 minutes talk on a very difficult topic of hand surgery thank you sir. as you rightly said at the end this is just an introduction of the topic yes and uh, if you see most of the hand surgery uh, publications we have got green and lister and so many books are there which uh, run into volumes so it is difficult to speak about hand surgery in total and i always tell that hand hand is a box of very important structures closely placed together and you really need to have a lot of uh, experience and expertise and exposure to deal with the problems of hand surgery and uh, no one can cover uh, whole gamut of hand surgery in a talk of 1 hour or uh, 45 minutes and it's very diff- very interesting to see your progress from uh, general surgery to an an accomplished microsurgeon and hand surgeon at this Thank moment you. and i'm also very happy to talk to all of you that uh, i am indirectly connected to two very important hand transplant centers 
one is Amrita where Jimmy is working and uh, second is most of us has connection to Jipmer and Jipmer is another hand transplant center. They have already done uh, two, three hand transplants successfully in past two, three years. So that way I am quite happy to uh, connect myself to these two centers. And I am very happy to see the progress and the expertise of uh, Dr. Jimmy. Now, coming to uh, the training part which you raised is very, very in interesting. And uh, if I remember, we had started MCH in hand surgery in Chennai and uh, uh, Ganga Hospital. And uh, somehow it did not pick up so well because of some intricacies of the uh, their development, procedural uh, problems. And But this is a very important topic, a very important specialty, I should say, that we should have a accreditation process and training. And because of this uh, lack of uh, true training facilities, we are not able to have very good hand surgeons in uh, most of the hospitals in our country. There are very few very good hand surgeons in our country. And that's why most of the onus falls on the plastic surgeons, wherever they have experience. And most of the orthopedic surgeons, they are now uh, taking the main chunk of uh, surgical uh, uh, cases of uh, hand to be managed. I know I work with one of the orthopedic surgeon who is uh, orthopedic uh, hand surgeon. And then I see the result and uh, we can, together we can do much better than individually two of us uh, doing separately. So, that's what I can talk about the uh, training. And it's very high time that uh, just like in the UK, you have got the hand surgery uh, fellowships. We should have uh, MCH or DNB or fellowship programs in hand surgery, which, is, uh, which, is, which will go a long way in taking care of the patients and uh, our, our uh, hand issues. Uh, any anybody will like to ask any question or comment among the uh, participants and delegates. Dr. Pushatman, you are yeah, yeah. in Stanley Hospital where uh, hand surgery was uh, literally, you know. Yeah, actually, yeah, Jimmy has brought out uh, beautifully the entire spectrum of uh, hand surgery. Thank so you. many, and uh, in fact, he himself has said so many is not able to touch upon. Because that is why uh, Professor Venkat Sami emphasized the training must be very important and they must be all well trained before they touch up any major case like that. And uh, that is one thing, the training which is very, very important must be there before they even embark a small suturing. And, and uh, those days it was very strict and everybody followed and uh, that was maybe one of the reasons why most of the his students are very successful. A big example is Ganga Hospital, I suppose. And uh, he also always mentioned the primary treatment. The primary treatment determines the ultimate outcome. So that's why primary treatment has to, primary treatment has to be good means some senior person must see the case, all the major cases, especially. Some senior person must see all the major cases and the decision has to be taken immediately after the patient's arrival, not after about six hours or next day like that. So that is why he drew a red line from the casualty, bypassing all the casualty, straight away all hand injury will land up in plastic surgery department. So that that is one of the reasons why the Stanley was so successful with those days and even today. And uh, good thing you brought out about the awareness because uh, uh, May still, even today, many people ask me, even after 22 years, 30 years working in, with Professor Rangan Sami and ex doing exclusively hand surgery workup, many people ask me whether you do this, whether you do that. And uh, that is one thing because every now and then we have to tell them that we, we can do a good job or a better job than most of, for a simple example, the, the glomus tumor. Because I have seen one glomus tumor, 
suffering for nearly 20 years. I even have a photo I can show to the, you if possible. He was always covering his, he was a big priest. He was always covering the thumb with a wet cloth, wet cloth. Only that gave him little relief. He had carpal tunnel release. He had a decurvent release. He had blocks in the neck, still a ganglion block, so, but it could not relieve. A simple thing, because what the mind do not know, the eyes do not see. That's why if such things are directly dealt by hand surgeons, they can uh, definitely be a big help to the society. For example, uh, fingertip injury. Many fingertip injury, recently, one of my close relative child, one year old, in a nine, 10 month old child, had a fingertip injury. As you said, they forgot to see the fingertip, it was not uh, pink and bleeding. So they sutured, tightly sutured it. It became gangrenous. But a young uh, girl, child, the parents, it becomes a big issue. It may be a fingertip, but it becomes a major issue. So, so much is there in hand surgery. The only thing is the awareness, and uh, probably Jimmy's talk is beautifully brought out about the awareness about hand surgery. Thank you. Thank you. So, we have uh, Professor Nagsami, senior anesthetist, who was uh, involved in uh, Stanley Hospital's hand unit for many years. Uh, Dr. Nagsami, would you like to say something? Nagasami and all, we are all worked together for years together. <laughs> Welcome, sir. He's one of the best anesthetists I've seen in my life. Nagasami is there? We are logged in, sir, but uh, I'm not able to find him. Yeah, I have my classmate, uh, Jayadev. Uh, uh, from Madurai. Oh. When I was uh, working with uh, Professor Venkat Swami, once we had a reference of a child from a very influential rich family from the Madurai area with a fingertip injury, which had been managed uh, there. And uh, when I went through the case sheet before anesthetic, I saw his beautiful handwriting and all the notes and everything. And uh, when the dressing was opened and Professor Venkat Swami said that, you know, Oh, the right thing has been done. I felt so proud that I was his classmate. So, uh, Jaydev, we'd like to hear from you about hand surgery. Jaydev, unmute yourself, please. Hi. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya. I'm not from Madhra. I am in Salem. Okay. <laughs> I am in Salem. I am weak and... in geography. Yeah. 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 Uh, Hi, first, I would <laughs> like to offer my uh, respects to my teacher, Dr. Karun Agarwal. Sir, oh. good evening, sir. Good evening. Pranam, Pranam sir. Pranam. Jai Dev. Uh, it's very nice seeing you, sir. Good, good uh, to see you. He has been my teacher in plastic surgery for so many years, you know. And uh, with regard to hand surgery, he used to tell us one thing. The hand is the extension of our brain, you know. Our hand is the extension of the brain because with the hands only we feel, we touch, we uh, work, we do fine things, we do coarse things, everything. We play music, um, whatever, heavy work, anything. We do fine surgery, including this plastic surgery with the hands only. So he used to tell, he used to keep drilling it into us that the hands are the extension of our brain and we have to give that much of care uh, to the hand. And we don't give that much of care to the hand. Any hand injury, we just dismiss it, you know, we dismiss it. We don't uh, give uh, proper importance to the hand. Whereas if you have a small chest pain, then you immediately say, oh, heart attack, heart attack. You are immediately admitted into the ICU. You know, I see you, then a cardiologist will see and this and that. But for a hand surgery, you are admitted in a general ward. No, uh, proper care is not given because of the lack of hand surgeons and the lack of plastic surgeons and the lack of knowledge of the importance of the hand with the, the of the uh, doctors in general. That is what, of the doctors in general, the lack of understanding of the a lack of knowledge of the importance of the hand of other surgeons. That is what 
relegates hand injuries to the general ward you know general ward common ward and then say oh just a hand injury just a finger injury wait for a few more hours what is going to happen you are not going to lose your life you know so that is what is happening whereas for the patient the hand is very very important for a laborer for a laborer the hand that is his breadwinner if he loses his hand he loses his job and then the entire family suffers so for the patient the hand is very important and like jimmy said the hand is not such a simple thing that can be covered in a, in an hour talk if we decide to go into the aspects of the hand you know just like how our modern medicine has become compartmentalized even now hand injury can be compartmentalized as a person will deal only with fingertip injuries a person will deal only with flexor tendon injuries only extensor tendon injuries only fractures of the phalanges only flap covers things like that you know specialization can go on only nerve injuries only vessel injuries arterial injuries like that it can go on and on and on for a person to be quite competent in hand surgery yes he needs a very good training and that training has to be given in a proper center which has adequate number of patients and a very good teacher like dr karun agarwal he was uh, my teacher he taught me he taught me i started plastic surgery even before i joined ms general surgery i worked in plastic surgery department under dr karun agarwal and we had a very good ward with the minor ot and we used to do all our cases there and uh, he will guide he will be standing beside me and he will be guiding me and he will be telling me what to do what not to do how to do and how not to do that is the kind of training that is required to make a very good plastic surgeon you know plastic surgeons cannot be made by attending these kind of uh, uh what do you say online classes or online tutorials no 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 <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my intent dev <laughs> dev uh, dr nagasami has joined us uh, dr nagasami would you uh, please unmute yourself uh, uh, sir has even scrubbed up and helped the junior surgeons for uh, uh, you know hand injuries at night uh, dr nagasami thank you priya prabhu no. Uh, time given to me <clears throat> am i audible yes sir yes sir but we can't see you though we, we can't, can't see you we can't see you <laughs> okay okay and uh, can you see yeah, me now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. hello hello sir uh, hi vp <laughs> um i just want to share a few things uh, i have been working for doctors since with plastic surgeons <laughs> uh, you know doctor how hard it was uh, carrying all the loads <laughs> so It's an app description for me. Uh, so I can't see the video. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so I joined the Department of Plastic Surgery as an exclusive anesthetist for plastic surgery in the year 1988 in Stanley Medical College. And uh, till my retirement, I refused two promotions and continued to work there till 2006. <clears throat> and a uh, lot of my colleagues were asking me how i chose to work with there and uh, it is because of the discipline inculcated in the department by professor r venkat swami uh, before whom i worked with professor t srinivasan who was a strict disciplinarian to bring some respect to the specialty of anesthesia and recognition for the anesthesia by the icu management in uh, anesthetic bringing anesthetic care under the anesthetic care <clears throat> and uh, uh we have done a, a number of cases for poor people especially the north chennai uh, area where a lot of uh, industries uh, happen and uh, we used to get almost about 30 to 40 cases of hand injury every day <clears throat> being a specialist department and uh, Uh, it was professor venkat swami's idea that uh, one anesthetist cannot manage all these cases with uh, help of anesthesia so he trained his uh, uh, pgs as well as assistants in giving the blocks 
<clears throat> like axillary block and uh, digital block and other things. And uh, as a training for anesthesiologists, it was a heaven for all those PGs to learn the blocks there when they come for a short period of uh, one or two months, <clears throat> because they would get to give at least 10 to 15 uh, axillary blocks or supraclavicular blocks per day, <clears throat> which uh, volume you cannot see anywhere else in the in any institution of uh, uh, high repute or caliber. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, because I was the sole anesthetist for a long time without any uh, other qualified anesthetist and had the help of only postgraduates, in spite of doing voluminous work, I could not publish much uh, papers. <clears throat> but we have had uh, plenty of experience in doing uh, microsurgery. In fact, I, even before I joined the department, I was, uh, I was uh, I'm <clears throat> fortunate enough to anesthetize uh, uh, toe transfer microsurgery for 14 hours in a 14-year-old boy. The pictures which I sent to Vidya today afternoon. Uh, with spontaneous breathing in the Meckel circuit under general anesthesia without any complications and patient recovered well and the surgery also had a wonderful result. <clears throat> so I had given a talk on uh, the management of anesthesia for microsurgery and uh, pre-implantation and other things way back in 1991 when Professor organized a, a society for hand injury, I mean microvascular surgery. <clears throat> And if I recall that uh, my experience there, uh, we started with uh, general anesthesia. And in fact, uh, we anesthetists used to feel a little bit uh, uh, bogged down because uh, uh, plastic surgeons used to want uh, a request for uh, anesthesia, uh, general anesthesia even for suture removal, especially in cleft lip and palate. So we used to uh, uh, comment on that saying that they are too fussy and uh, why can't they do it uh, without anesthesia for suture removal and all that. But then um, I, re I recall why they wanted that because if the baby is crying and moving about, uh, removal of one or two sutures can disfigure the whole uh, hard work they have done in repairing the lip. So all that I realized only when I became mature enough to understand that. And we had a very good understanding with all the surgeons and that is one of the main reasons why I did not want to leave the department and continue till my retirement, even though I was offered professor post in another, uh, other medical colleges. And uh, luckily, I had all very good understanding surgeons with me working there. So even if I have to say you have postponed this case, <clears throat> they will not fight with me and they'll say, okay, sir, we'll do it now tomorrow or day after, no problem. And equally, I was uh, very conscious in my work and I had done uh, uh, microsurgeries for a maximum of 32 hours. <clears throat> one case we started the previous day, one uh, constable assaulted by uh, the rowdies and uh, she had a amputation done at the um, mid-arm level. And we wanted to re-implant that. And, uh, the surgery went on and on for uh, almost 32 hours. I started it on the previous day. And uh, doing well also. So this was my experience with them. And uh, the amount of gratification or uh, satisfaction you get once the patient is able to, especially the hand is uh, such an important target. You will realize only when you don't have a finger or a part of the finger, when you do your normal day-to-day -day work, then only you will realize. When you get a paranychia or a small injury in the finger also, when you are not able to use that finger, you know how hard it is to carry out your day-to-day -day work. So <clears throat> this is the thing. And uh, uh, the hand surgery department gives uh, plenty of opportunities for anesthesia also for postgraduate training in all sorts of blocks. We have done a lot of vitravenous regional anesthesia for tendon repairs. Whenever you do a tendon, the surgeon wants to check the integrity of the repair on the table. At the time, they have asked us to not to block the motor, and but only sensory. And I have even given anesthesia like that for an IAS officer's wife, despite being a very VIP patient. I explained to her and said the surgeon would like to see the result on the table. So you please cooperate. I'll do a 
IVRA bias block and uh, we can see the result that the patient was happy, a surgeon was happy. Like that, they gave me full freedom to <clears throat> uh, practice whatever technique is uh, best and uh, most suitable for the surgery. And uh, I have no regrets having worked there for so many years. Thank you. If you have any questions on this, I would like to be, I would be very happy to answer. Uh, Dr. Ganesh uh, has trained both in India as well as uh, UK. So, Ganesh, would you like to share your experience of training under Dr. Uh, Professor R.V. and uh, Dr. Purushottaman and uh, your subsequent career in UK? Ganesh, oh, surprise. Ganesh, can you unmute yourself? Uh, so uh, while uh, Ganesh gets around to it, we have Professor Raghavendran, another anesthetist who's worked with uh, plastic surgeons for many years. Uh, Dr. Raghavendran, your uh, input, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vidya. It's a very nice meeting. I uh, uh, I have known Dr. Jimmy as a very good uh, writer, but I've seen him that he can uh, talk very well also. <laughs> Excellent uh, lecture. I, I regularly you know, read up his uh, all his um, uh, write-ups, no, so hilarious. No, and thank really, you, sir. Thank you. Uh, see, I've been a seat with the uh, surgeons for more than 20 years now with Dr. Sridhar, who's a well-known uh, hand surgeon. And they used to comment uh, that in his career, he has got only two hand surgeons. One is Dr. Nagasami, other one is myself. So, I talk very highly about Dr. Nagasami and real pleasure to know him, actually. <clears throat> so, I think probably he'll tell about me, Dr. Nagasami, also. I think that's what I feel. <laughs> so, as far as uh, plastic surgery is concerned, no, the anesthetist, we can't set any time limits. And especially if it is an emergency case, we just come prepared for a very long uh, working hour, actually. So we just come with a heavy meal and sit there and find some time, find some method to pass the time somehow. No? Because surgeons will keep on operating for hours and hours. They'll say about say, three hours or four hours, but it'll be, give, go on for at least about 14, 15 hours. So, so you have to keep yourself nourished and uh, Somehow, no, you had to pass the time now. But the results will be fascinating. You know? And then Dr. Sridhar is a very good um, uh, teacher also. In between, you know, he'll keep on telling his uh, uh, assistants on how to go about and how to do some minor repairs and that. You know? So they're very nice in, uh, to see all these things now. But in his, uh, in his um, assessment of anesthetists, good anesthetists will keep a patient totally immobile. And bad anesthetics will make the patient uh, move. <laughs> so we just, somehow we uh, keep the patient very well paralyzed through the uh, you know, surgery and then uh, keep them under good anesthesia. And now uh, we have been uh, giving them a lot of pain relief also post-op with the nerve blocks and infusions and all. And then there are some requirements which are required you know, which are for surgeons, like you know, uh, keep the hydration and avoid hypothermia and those things. Not. Apart from that, you no. Know, so otherwise it's a very, very patient work. And uh, they do the work, and then we enjoy the work. That's how it goes, actually. So, and uh, I've been assisted with uh, Dr. Sridhar for so many uh, years now. I think uh, right from the implantations, and then free flap transfers, and then uh, real hand work, and very amazing uh, work actually they're doing. And I'm still I'm with the team only, so I still continue to enjoy the work. Actually. So, a nice uh, working with the plastic team. And uh, there's a lot of fulfillment because when you see the final result, that is so gratifying. Thank you. Uh, uh, Radha Krishna, uh, anything you'd like to add? <clears throat> I'm not sure who else is. Uh... No, the, uh, actually, it's so nice to see Dr. Nagasar because I mean, I was a PG when uh, he was all, he never had a white, white hair. He's slightly plump those days, but the, uh, those I was there as a PG between 86 89, sir, in Stanley. And, uh, I used to tag on with Dr. Sridhar and Dr. Sridhar used to smoke a lot of cigarettes those days while on duty. <clears throat> but you had one young anesthetist, one thin, tall man, uh, I think, uh, was a number two in your department. Uh, yeah, yeah, not Chapin. He was not, not Chapin. Chapin. <laughs> yeah. He was he there. He's now in the US. <laughs> now, that, that department, I think, was at the peak at that time. And, you know, I, I was lucky enough uh, to get into the theater to watch uh, uh, Professor Venkatesam and others uh, uh, operate, and you know, it's, it's such uh, Elan. And uh, I used to see the uh, results and the physiotherapy department, the way they conduct the morning clinics, uh, 
uh, with all the X-rays, uh, before, after, and all. Morning, one see one. Uh, uh, all, what all is done the previous night is to be discussed in first thing in the morning. And that's wonderful. But uh, Jimmy again, uh, Jimmy is uh, such a famous uh, person in learning general surgery. Uh, is a yes, very sir. very good overview of the talk. But I have two very painful questions. I, I know as a, a representative learning general surgery. Question number one is. Um, has hand surgery developed the way it should? Has it percolated across the country? Because 30 years ago, there was a famous department. Has it done? I don't know. No, I'm not sure. If it is uh, percolated, why? If it's not percolated, why? Question one. Sir, uh, I would honestly say that, I see, I don't know a lot of things about it, but to tell, to be honest, the way we started out in hand surgery in India was good. But the way it percolated was, I told you, very late and inadequate, especially in the uh, public sector. And I don't know exact reasons that has to be assessed. So that's what I said. When I was in Calicut Medical College in 2004, 2005, the situation was that the hand surgeries were probably the worst managed um, injuries in that entire very good otherwise center. Okay. And right, and after that 2005 period, around 2010, they must have started in earnest. Court time started almost at the same time, around 2003, 2002, that they started. So it is only after the 2000s that the public hospitals in India has, has properly started managing hand surgery, I would say. I'm not sure. Probably exceptions would be places, some places in Bombay, some municipal centers in Bombay, probable exceptions. That's what I would say. And of course, Stanley in uh, Madras. But then uh, most of the developments, rapid developments have been in the private sector. Especially in Kerala, I, I, I know because it has started from specialist hospital in maybe in the 90s, eight, and then to then uh, uh, when the second center was actually the baby memorial uh, hospital and then Amrita, all around 2005, 2000, that time. Yeah. yeah the second sure. question, before uh, I ask Jaydev to come in, the second important question is, uh, today afternoon, uh, Dr. Mohammed Idris, one of our cardiac surgeons, came to my room and he has come with a questionnaire. He wanted to put in learning general surgery. So questionnaire is, to the MS General Surgery Postgraduates, which super specialty would you prefer? Why? Which super specialty you will not prefer and why? You know, because the issue there is, why don't you prefer cardiothoracic surgery is the question. Then I was telling him, evening there's a, a talk, uh, Idris, I might ask this very difficult question is, why people are not choosing plastic surgery? Why is there's no craze for plastic surgery as much as it is there for gastro surgery, uh, oncology, and uh, uh, say uh, urology? Uh, you know, I want every one of you to comment on that. Why is not become interesting to postgraduate See, The number of seats are going waste. Uh, sir, I'll answer this because um, I'll try to answer it. Plastic surgery was not my first choice. My first choice was gastro surgery. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but that time seats were very less, and only there was only one seat in Kerala. And then I tried for that once, that first one. Then I, I thought, no, I will not try for more. Then I'll go into, uh, into some other specialty. That is how I went to plastic surgery. But why I thought I would go to GA surgery was that I had a lot of exposure in GA surgery, primarily in general surgery. So I feel that the general surgeons in our country are primarily trained in GA surgery and they think that is the most um, you know, prestigious branch of surgery and they're already trained a lot in that. And they don't want to waste that training and go into another surgery. And they also see a lot of prestigious. That is why I think primarily the more many of them are interested in GA surgery. Uh, now the now coming to other specialities. Now the second one, onco surgery. I am not sure why they are interested in onco surgery. I would think that because it is a very general surgery, that they can continue to do. They think that they can continue to do the same abdominal, chest, 
and uh, surgeries in onco surgery that is one reason and there is a huge requirement too but there is a problem with the onco surgery because it is a fragmented specialty i think specialty fragmentation is a problem lack of guidelines and whom who should operate is a problem that is the problem with plastic surgery too but right now i see a lot of interest increasing in plastic surgery uh, the problem plastic surgery is going to face in the future is fragmentation no one knows what plastic surgery exactly do and uh, they think that some of them think that okay they may do microsurgery but no one knows that they are also doing hand surgery and it has fragmented a lot it's only the cosmetic surgery that is primarily in plastic surgery and a lot of general surgeons are not primarily interested in cosmetic so they are not coming to plastic surgery but as you said in the oxford textbook of recent oxford textbook of surgery i just went through the plastic surgery section some few years back and there's written in that in the plastic surgery section it is written plastic surgery is the last of the standing general surgeons we are the last of the standing general surgeons because it is such a general specialty but the problem is that it is difficult to get trained in all aspect of plastic surgery so it is bound to get fragmented in the future so i don't know what is going to happen to plastic surgery in the future if you look at all over the world especially like us and places like that where whom we are following uh, by some for some reason or the other most of the plastic surgeons there are primarily interested in only cosmetic and then they unless we have one year fellowships none of our specialties are going to have any future we you should have one year hand one year craniomax special one year peripheral sarcoma or one year breast oncoplasty where you can do both primarily primary resections as well and things like that you have to have an option of 5 6 one year fellowships open for the sub specialties similar similar sub specialties like pediatric surgery uh, like gastro surgery like hepatobiliary you should it should not be too much it should be only one year uh, so that you can train and you can get a you, you can get a accreditation and then you you can do that primary sub specialty as well as that fellowship specialty as your special interest so this is the way out i would feel so plastic surgery is one of the specialties which are with in which the uh, interest is increasing probably the seats are going vacant because there are now nowadays lot of seats now the urology is one of the uh, branches which has got a consistent following i would think that that is because there is a lot of requirement for urologists one thing secondly when the specialty is developed the lower urinary tract did not go to the nephrologist they kept it so they are the physicians as well as the surgeons of the uh, uh, ural urinary tract right from the calyx down and all the endoscopy all the pcnl everything is, is with them they have a lot of opds they have a lot of patients that is why the urology has got such a uh, importance and it is such a nice specialty that is why it, rem it remains like that now the specialties which are going to go down neurosurgery is definitely many people want neurosurgery because there are increasing it's a challenging specialty is rapidly developing and lot of trauma and the results are increasing i mean uh, improving and neurosurgery is also becoming uh, sought after i would say the thing the surgeons which who are really going to lose out are even though they are currently good the onco surgeons are going to lose out i would say they may be left with only the breast and pediatric surgeons and cardiac surgeons are going to see you know a downward trend in cardiac surgery primarily because they were not able to keep uh, the, the the interventions and all the interventions has gone to the cardiologist and all the patients have gone from them to the cardiologist primary who sees the patient is very very important so if they have relinquished that thing that i would blame them the strict hierarchy and the attitude of the senior cardiac surgeon if i am alone i think i am alone i would put some of the blame on them unfortunately i am excuse me for saying this because somebody has to say all this otherwise these things are not going to come out uh, this is a problem with a lot of specialists but i find that neurosurgeons are coming back and taking back i am not saying who should do anybody can do good work but i would think that surgeons should be able to do interventions 
now our neuro there is a neurosurgeon in our uh, in our aims doing all the neuro interventions along with the uh, interventional radiologists so the interventions are coming back to neurology neurosurgeons but it's not happening in uh, it is not go it, it should happen in cardiac surgery also because why not any surgeon can do intervention if he is trained any cardiac surgeon say any well trained cardiac surgeon if he does one or two years in interventional cardiology he will be able to do interventional cardiology so i uh, these are the way we, i think we should think dr dr karun uh, yeah comments here but uh, your question is very 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 relevant and very well taken actually i was itching to talk about this uh, since jimmy has been talking i i was just muting and unmuting in fact uh, this is a very contentious issue which we have been discussing amongst very senior colleagues and uh, association of plastic surgeons that the interest is definitely waning off to some extent as uh, jimmy said now there is again growing uh, interest in plastic surgery but the pertinent question is why there is not means why the seats are going vacant and why interest is relatively less as compared to other super specialty the reason is because plastic surgery is neither organ related nor system related yes if you see other uh, the successful uh, super specialists super specialties they are all system related most of them and are organ related so because we do not have one concentrated area to work on that is giving a fragmentation which jimmy uh, rightly put that word fragmentation so the people do not know whom to go because we don't have the system which we are dealing with second thing is because we have too many areas to work on there is lot of overlapping between us and other super specialties or other specialties and now we are uh, struggling some of us in some of the centers some of the regions we are struggling to fight with other specialties to gain momentum and then the new young generation because they are not able to fight with the other vocal specialties or more dominant specialties they are losing out on their practice or their importance that's why the plastic surgery is gradually not uh, remaining so much interest now cosmetic surgery i can give you example cosmetic surgery or cosmetic work now we are uh, we are entangled between dermato surgery or dermatology and beautician beauty parlors and untrained or unskilled people who are doing the cosmetic work so most of them are more vocal more uh, you can say some of them do unethical practices also they go for the marketing they go for the advertisement which most of the plastic surgeons they don't want to do or they are not accustomed to do because we are all mch and then ethically bound so that's how uh, these are the couple of reasons which i can tell you that this is the, these are the reasons why plastic surgery is not remaining number 1 or number 2 and we are falling behind in the important there are many other reasons which uh, we don't need to deal with anything pushataman has to say ah. i would like to say the same thing tarun actually in fact i have a talk who is a plastic surgeon there is the same thing i say he has to be a burn surgeon he has to be a cleft lip surgeon he has to be a peripheral nerve surgeon he has to be a brachial plexus surgeon he has to be a microvascular surgeon hand surgeon like that you have cosmetic surgeon like that you have tubs uh, almost 10 sub specialties <laughs> so i i always uh, consider uh, we are something like a multifaceted diamond each facet has got one face to show and i always compare our feel like a big banyan tree and each the what we what we call in tamil as viludu until it hangs it is a wait for the main branch trunk once it gets landed it's the ground it will support the main branch so like that each one is a sub specialty can be a burden initially but after you after, for example edgar beamer you know he was the almost the first generation microvascular surgeon and uh, some of the clamps are designed invented by them but uh, after 90s he became a aesthetic surgeon pure aesthetic surgeon he was until then uh, 
one number one microvascular surgeon in germany he became a aesthetic surgeon because as you become old it is little easy to do those kind of thing less number of hours to work more money like that so that's where people of course uh, you want to be a thorough bred uh, plastic surgeon you have to put years and years of struggle and uh, commitment then only you can become a thorough bred for that people are, are not willing to especially the younger generation is not willing to take that kind of grinding nowadays you finish mch you immediately you become you call yourself a cosmetic surgeon or a aesthetic surgeon do some fillers botox and do some uh, I, i still remember on uh, famous uh, uh, plastic surgeon in chennai aesthetic surgeon even he will not you uh, will not be ashamed to say i you will say i know only eight surgeries and i will do only these eight surgeries and he stick followed that and he showed the best results in that so like that it is plastic surgery is a wide field and uh, i even today i don't regret taking plastic field anybody who's willing uh, to come for an advice free advice i will suggest them go, go take take a plastic surgery because you can branch out into any one of them can karun has done a lot of cleft lip he can become a club but ultimately he has become a author of the, one of the i don't know how many of you have seen that uh, he has brought out a six seven volumes of plastic surgery manual and uh, the last one is still completed karun or is still waiting yeah, it's completed completed completed, right? completed. Yeah. so he is the brought out a huge manual of life. so so much of uh, subject and uh, material is available with us only thing is we have to properly channelize it uh, channelize it if you just give me one second to contribute to this discussion am i audible yes sir ah uh, uh, i recall a very famous uh, very very important saying which uh, ingrained in my mind by one uh, dr t c chandran who said plastic surgery plastic surgeons actually operate from head to foot doing from calvaryoplasty to wound embrayment in diabetic foot yes and uh, he said the strength and weakness of a plastic surgery is that because they have to do any surgery from head to foot this is the strength as well as the weakness so if uh, really good plastic surgeon he has to shine he has to know the entire anatomy of the body and uh, each and every part he has to he may be suddenly call so compartmentalizing this uh, department into say aesthetic surgery and uh, cleft lip and cleft palate uh, division and uh, hand surgery and micro surgery may be good for the development of that particular branch but then as a comprehensive surgeon you have to know at least the basics of each and every specialty and at this juncture i would like to thank dr karun agarwal for uh, permitting me to contribute a small chapter on anesthesia for genital plastic surgery in the first volume thank you very yes. much yes dr nagaswami i remember it well actually i wanted to talk about it you have already touched upon this and uh, this is the volume in which dr nagaswami and uh, dr pushatman have contributed Uh, even i have, i was i have contributed on maxillary reconstruction <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know that i got a syndicate here together <laughs> <laughs> thank you with your nice nice of you to have thought about all this uh, bringing together the like minded people <laughs> so beautiful so all your questions are answered pata or anything remaining yeah, yeah. very well answered thank you and if anyone else has anything to say please raise your hand otherwise we've been here for almost an hour and a half if nobody dr. has Vidya, dr ravi shankar is there uh, dr ravi uh, shankar yeah uh, dr ravi and uh, not the junior ravi shankar the senior <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> professor ravi shankar from pondicherry sir can you unmute yourself please Ravi slept off. <laughs> <laughs> Must be having his dinner, I suppose. Uh, nobody has any questions. Yeah, Nala like is there. Nala is there. Ravi has not worked with plastic surgeons. Wait. <laughs> 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 uh, Thank you. 
So uh, I uh, some closing comments from both uh, Dr. Purushottaman and uh, Dr. Karunanurvan. Yes, Dr. Purushottaman, go ahead. I think it was a wonderful session. Uh, especially, I th thank Dr. Vidya, Dr. Jimmy, Dr. Pata, and of course Karun. To only only one thing I want to say, because we we should not encroach onto the other areas. Like for example, though we are trained in general surgery. We, I don't do regular hernias, only abdominal hernias uh, with the, especially women or abdominal recurrent hernias or abdominal hernias, I do. Regular inguinal hernia, I won't touch. If it comes to me, I'll refer to the general surgeon. If you be like that, then probably, you know, they also will not uh, uh, find it, uh, not hesitate to refer any complicated or take your help. That is one advice I would like to give to all uh, plastic surgeons so that you try to respect them also so that you also be equally respected. That is the only thing I want to say. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Vidya, it has been a beautiful session and uh, comment a couple of things which I would like to uh, have my closing remark. One is you started saying that uh, Pushataman is a man of very few words. And uh, I'm really happy to see the way a couple of, uh, some of the people whom I thought they are people of very few words have been talking so well. And uh, their, their delivery of <laughs> expression is so impressive. Jimmy, I never thought he speaks so much. <laughs> and uh, when you are working with I, I also I also thought a wild card entry yeah, sir he was one of the, wild card entry he was one of the quietest he was one of the quietest uh, resident when I remember one month of his uh, when he was going I told him D do you really speak <laughs> he was kind of person third person is Dr. Jaydev Jaydev spoke so well today and uh, he was one of my favorite resident when I was working in uh, Jipmar in 80s, because he will be available around the clock 24 7. He will be available for emergencies. And we used to do uh, not like what Dr. Nagaswamy talked about uh, 30 35 hand surgeries, but we used to do almost 10 to 15 uh, emergencies almost every day. And uh, all the routine work will be there, but still, whole night he will be working for. Uh, and we used to get a lot of human bites. So human bites we used to reconstruct in night and hand injuries we used to do in night in that minor OT. So he was one of the person who was a person of very few words who spoke so well and I was really happy to see him uh, growing like an experienced plastic surgeon. Another aspect of your uh, this session was a beautiful combination of plastic surgeons and anesthetists. I, I always had a very good relationship with almost every anesthetist whom I work with. I can name whole uh, uh, host of uh, anesthetists in Jipmer and Savdajang Hospital along with whom I had very good relationship and very good working. I was really happy and impressed with Dr. Nagaswamy's comment about uh, role of anesthetist uh, in, uh, when plastic surgeons are performing surgery, like you had to pass time <laughs> not truly really past time. <laughs> and, and I think uh, we inculcated, I never worked in uh, Stanley, but probably I got a lot of uh, training indirectly from uh, Stanley for doing this many blocks. I was uh, interested in a lot of hand blocks, axillary block, continuous block. I used to give supracalicular myself and uh, axillary continuous block myself. Uh, these are all uh, percolated from nearby uh, Chennai, Dr. Pushottaman and Dr. Arvis used to do all those things and uh, we used to do a lot. So the combination of good anesthesia and a good surgical team, it, uh, it remains unparalleled for any surgical discipline and especially plastic surgery because we need to have long lasting association. And uh, it, Stanley is very fortunate to have Dr. Nagaswamy staying for so long. I never had that uh, very few surgeons will have that uh, liberty to have one anesthetist throughout their career. But uh, whomsoever I worked, I, I really enjoyed. Uh, and I remember Dr. Vidya uh, as senior resident working in uh, OT7 and 8, and we used to have very good uh, time there. 
So thank you for remembering me and keeping me as one of the participants here. And I enjoyed the whole talk of Jimmy and the interaction with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jimmy, for that uh, good Thank talk. You. I was a little worried how he's going to get through 75 slides in 40 minutes, but he yeah. hoped his, uh, his writing skills came to the fore. He hoped this wonderful story. And uh, thank you so much uh, for you. keeping all of us uh, engaged. I have enjoyed uh, watching. Uh, I am one of those anesthetists who actually likes to watch surgery. Uh, so I have enjoyed the surgeries of uh, Dr. Tarun and Dr. Pushottaman, though I have never seen you or Pata operate, but uh, maybe sometime in the future. Jayadev, I knew, would become plastic surgeon because even for the radical mastectomies in general surgery, he used to close the skin so beautifully. So I knew before even Jayadev knew that he's going to do plastic surgery. So thank you, uh, all of you, for joining. Uh, take care and stay safe. And we'll meet next Thursday with another episode of Marvelous. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.